So, welcome back, everyone. I would now like to introduce our next guest, Chris Salter, and his following talk, Alien Agency, Technoscience, Art, and the Limits of Knowing. His talk focuses on the new scientific and technological paradigms that the faculty and students of the Black Mountain College focused on into artistic practice. Taking a productive tour on the term alien agency through the historically groundbreaking outcome of Black Mountain College, Sauter will pick up on the narratives drawn by so sociologists of science like Bruno Latour and claims a powerful parallel between artists working with science and technology. Chris Salter is an artist, university research chair in new media, technology, and the census at Concordia University and co-director of the Hexagram Network for Research Creation in Media Arts, Design, Technology, and Digital Culture in Montreal. He studied philosophy and economics at Emory University and completed a PhD in directing and dramatic criticism at Stanford University, where he also researched and studied at CCMRA. Most interesting for our topic as well, he collaborated with Peter Sellers and William Forsythe and the Frankfurt Ballet and showed his work at venues such as the Venice Architecture Biennale, the Vitra Design Museum, the Hau Berlin, the National Art Museum of China, Ars Electronica, and many others. He's the author of Entangled, Technology and the Transformation of Performance and Alien Agency Experimental Encounters with Art in the Making. Currently, Chris Salter is working on a new collaborative book project for the Mid Press focused on the contemporary interconnections between art, theory, and research. And therefore, again at our conference, one of those researchers that combine art and science and work and person. Please welcome Chris Salter. Morgen. I um, just want to thank uh, Aneta Lehmann and uh, everybody else for inviting me. Um, I actually live in Berlin part of the time, so I, but I teach in Montreal, so I was just arrived last night, so I'm leaving again tonight to go to Australia, so I'm in that jet lag Schwelle uh, Zustand right now. Um, uh, historically, Black Mountain College can be seen not only for its, of course, groundbreaking development of interdisciplinary models for education and art, but also, uh, as, as Ava pointed out very well, uh, the pioneering work of its faculty and students who later brought scientific and technological paradigms, processes, and instruments into artistic practice. So, for instance, Cunningham, uh, Cage, and Rauschenberg were all involved in the so-called EAT project, the Experiments in Art and Technology in the 1960s. And interestingly enough, um, even dancers like Yvonne Rayner, Tricia Brown, Lucinda Childs, and others who kind of eschewed the with the work of postmodern dance at the Judson Church in the 1950s and 1960s, eschewed the kind of uh, Gesamtkunstwerk formal models of uh, modernism um, were very interested in technologies and were also involved in the EAT projects as well as the famous Nine Evenings uh, Theater and Engineering that took place at the Park uh, Avenue Armory in New York in 1966. So in fact, these, these artists, these performing artists saw the use of science and technology as a kind of objective, rule-based, uh, rigorous type of system in order to continue their practice. Um, so now I'm going to kind of jump into the future, well, from, from Black Mountain to the present and even to the future uh, in this talk. And I want to focus uh, talk on this book uh, that just came out from MIT Press here. I love plugging books here in public. Um, uh, in, in, in spring this year, uh, called Alien Agency Experimental Encounters with Art in the Making. And it picks up a lot of the threads that we were, we were discussing today, exploring how it is that artists, researchers, or, or what we term in Canada, research creators. This is a very interesting distinction between Kunstwischer Forschung here, that research and creation are mixed together, but it doesn't, creation doesn't necessarily mean art. It could be architecture, it could be writing, it could be other forms of the non-visual arts. Um, it looks at how, how those kinds of research creators are currently working in, in techno-science paradigms to produce 
new performative assemblages that challenge how we actually experience the world. And in some ways, uh, we look at how not only our phenomena that artists work with destabilized, but also our perception of that phenomena. Um, and so the book is very much squarely around the topic of this conference, which is basically how is creative research uh, seeking to answer a, the following question, which science also seeks to answer, which is how do new forms of knowledge, objects, things, or thoughts come into the world and what actually do they do? What do they do to the world? Uh, and so we'll pick up a couple of themes that, that, that James last night uh, also uh, critiqued in terms of is art a form of knowledge? Now, you also have to understand um, that the, the talk is in two parts. The first is giving you a bit of the epistemological framework of the book uh, and the context, of course, of the conference. And the second is, I mean, actually read a few things from, from it because I, you need to understand also how I, how I work through some of the questions. Um, and I'm wearing three hats right now and also in the book. One is an artist, the second as a professor and a research chair, a, a Lehrstuhl in the area of media and the senses, and the third, uh, as the director of a research center. This is called Hexagram, which is a big research center involving researchers from uh, art, design, uh, guys, uh, digital huma humanities, uh, and the sciences across four universities, five local partners in Montreal, and eight international partners. So, um, so I'm dealing with these questions all the time. So uh, Alien Agency focuses on three stories of what I call art in the making. Uh, it describes works that propose a different vision of the world, one that's dynamic, temporally emergent, contingent, and performative. And two intertwined questions drive the stories through the book. The first is theoretical. How is it that humans and media are co-produced in the act of making things? And to answer this, I try to provide an account that gives, that looks at materials like sound, biological stuff or biological material, and sensory input such as touch, taste, light, and how they can be used in techno-scientifically driven art practice that go beyond human intent. So I'll invoke some of the current discussions in new materialism as, as what it's called. Now the second question is methodological, which is how do you actually write an account of practice? with such materials, right? So, so what, what, what the book tries to do is provide a kind of template for depicting these research-based uh, creation or artistic practices in the making that might be actually useful for others. And there's a lot of, I'm sure, a lot of students in this room that are grappling with similar issues. So it manifests kind of what Bruno Latour called in Science in Action, science in the making is kind of over ready-made science, right? You think about its making as opposed to its established frame. Um, and along the way, I try to derail the anthropocentric idea that the artist is in charge of the world or in charge and control of the materials that he or she is using. So it's a kind of story from the trenches, you might say, from the black box, from the studio, from the laboratory, and from the street. In other words, I'm, I'm actually interested in an ontogenetic story. That is not what artistic works are, but how they actually come to be. The three projects that are described in this book the projects in the making are based on actually empirical fieldwork that I undertook between four, for four years, 2010 to 2014. And each of the uh, studies is around a, a specific question. So the first question is, and, it, and these questions derive from the artist, artist practice that I looked at. And in, in all cases, actually, I'm involved in these projects, either as a classic participant observer as a collaborator, but in work that it's not my own. And then the last project is actually work that's, that's my own. So the first question uh, looks at the work of, of Sam Allinger and Bruce Odlin. Sam Allinger is, of course, based in Berlin, very well-known sound artist and sonic thinker. And they resonate public spaces uh, all over the world. And the question is, how do you record the unrecordable experience of sense and effect in the sound of the city? in the sound of urban breathing, the acoustic life of the city. The second question is, how do you grow and keep alive muscle cells that move and can by themselves move outside of a body? That's a very strange question. That's a project that I'm going to Perth, Australia tomorrow to finish on, which opens next Friday. Um, and that's a work with Oren Katz and Ian Atsur from the Art Science Lab Symbiotica in the University of Western Australia. And that's the part I'm gonna deal with today. And the last project is how do you generate environments of light, vibration, smell, taste, 
that are possible to experience other cultural ways of sensing. But there's a larger question that looms in all of these, which is how is it that researchers and artists, creators, organize the conditions for experimental performative assemblages to form and catalyze other ways of knowing and being in the world that sidestep all of these old philosophical dichotomies between subjects and objects, human and non-human, mind and body, knowing and experiencing. Um, and then the bigger question, how is it possible then that this stuff at a distance that's not human, that's beyond us, can actually exert powerful effects and affects on our bodies, soul, and world? And then this question doesn't come from anywhere. It's actually situated in a long discourse and actually now a kind of seismic shift, as many of you know, that's taking place across a lot of disciplines and sites the university and the museum, the festival, the scientific laboratory, and the street. And it's being asked by anthropologists, human geographers, science studies scholars, and others. And it actually is the question of the limits of the Anthropocene. Now, this is, of course, this current trend in the range of philosophical discourses that go by lots of names, OOO, lots of, lots of acronyms, OOO, OOP, speculative realism, new materialism, you name it. Um, it seems to be totally new that we're suddenly questioning the limits of the Anthropocene. But in fact, if we look back uh, at the old epistemological battles in the history of science and in science and technology studies or science, technology, and society at the start of the 1970s, we see the traces of that. So already uh, Bruno Latour and Steve Woolgar's ethnographic study, Laboratory in Life, which many of you know from 1975, already the question of the material studies of scientific knowing start appearing. Um, Peter Gallison talked about the notion of material conditions of the laboratory. In Image and Logic, he says, quote, the manner in which the machines of physics, lowly instruments, laboratory machines can command our attention if they are understood as dense with meaning, not only laden with their direct function, but also embodying strategies of determination, demonstration, work relationships, and material and symbolic connections. Unquote. So in other words, the discussion about the materiality of practice is a long ongoing story. But at the same time, increasingly exhibitions and festivals ranging from the last documenta to Transmediale, which is here, and, and any, many, many others are increasingly trying to challenge the boundaries between the ecological, the biological, and the sensorial, and the boundary between the human and other entities. So audiences now encounter all sorts of weird hybrids, tissue-cultured living sculptures, the fluid dynamics of ferrofluids, light particles or hydrogenated bubbles, lasers animating emissions from power plants, grown furniture made of fungi, and quivering architectures made of gelatin, cymatic phenomena, machines that shit, and theatrical performances that consist of moving lights, there's fog, and there's not a human body in the room, and we still call that all performance. So what, what's actually going on here? Well, what would it mean to kind of rethink these questions of agency, materiality, and stuff from the point of view of the inside, from the point of view of making things? In other words, what I would like to argue is that, in fact, without making something, many of the philosophical questions that I put forward actually remain in the abstract. And this would be almost like trying to do, prove a scientific hypothesis without actually doing the experiment. Now, of course, science skeptics say things like, yes, you know, science and art are very different, which I'm going to acknowledge, absolutely they are. Um, science has an agreed upon set of methods to create truth based on these theories. And this is something I actually want to challenge a little bit. Okay, now based on what James Elkin said last night, it's important to state at the outset that, that the notion of research and creation is not the same as scientific research. Um, so I think of the work of composer Iana Sinakis, who co claimed that he was never doing scientific research in his work, but using scientific and mathematical techniques to invent new morphologies of aesthetic categories. In other words, art as researchers, I want to argue, actually make a substantially different claim than other disciplines, both scientific as well as interpretive, like the humanities, which is to focus on this idea that making is not just only a discursive contribution to the world, but it actually enacts the world that's actually proposed. And this is a really interesting thing, the dis distinction between describing something and actually enacting it, bringing it into being outside of words, but into the material conditions of the world. Um, 
Now, what I want to talk about a little bit is this, this framework of art and technology, what I want to call kind of techno-science, you know, and, and part of this is a move that's happened in science and technology studies, but it's to recognize today that many of the projects that are going on, um, even in the visual art world, which vehemently denies the existence of technology, because it somehow would poison the anti-capitalist tendency that artists have, which is very ironic considering the visual art world. But in fact, technology is increasingly becoming the kind of prime mover, um, whether biological, material, or computational, in both context, content, circulation, and distribution of many artistic works and experiences. So there's, there's two questions I'm gonna leave in your minds as I start to kind of get into the bigger questions of the book. And, and, and these are things I think actually that also are invoked from Black, Black Mountain College as well. So the first is the question of the ontological pronouncement of the human and the non-human. Um, do these actually hold up in practice? We can, it's nice to talk about this idea of the non-human, but are artists that are working with those materials that are somehow beyond their reach or their grasp, does that actually hold up in practice? Um, the second is, um, a bigger Pandora's box. And it seems that art is linked with techno-science and this becomes even more entangled within political, social, and economic agendas through these terms like practice-based research or practice-led research in the UK, artistic research in Germany or the Netherlands or Switzerland, research creation in Canada, art and research in the US, and, and on and on. There's this huge battery of terms to describe this territory. This is actually kind of strange. Now, as some of you know, the standard definition, well, let's say one standard definition of research is that research signifies new knowledge that coherently and systematically advances a field, is grounded and supported by established methods, and that's basically what, how you do something. Methodology is simply what, how you do it. And also techniques that are valid by, validated by social frameworks, peers, and also existing bodies of knowledge, models, and paradigms. In other words, there's a right way and a wrong way to do research. And the social structures, which Ludwig Fleck called in the 1920s Denkkollektiven, basically th thought collectives, uh, guide these norms and these methods. And it's, you, the notion of peer review goes, really goes back to the 1920s when, when Fleck says that science is never an individual activity. It's always socially regulated and controlled and shaped. So by the time you have a scientific idea, it moves and circulates through the scientific community. By the time it returns to you, it has nothing to do with what you originally imagined. It's not your own idea. It's actually the thought collective's idea. And unlike science, Wissenschaft, right, in, in German, the term research is actually a pretty recent phenomena. It actually goes back, as, as many of you know, uh, only to the end of the 19th century. The University of Berlin, of course, the model of Wilhelm von Humboldt, um, the, the idea of a default model of the research university was the bureaucratization of research. The notion of laboratories came out of that time. Before that, science was done individually. The Royal Society, of course, or Lavoisier's laboratory were actually individual labs. They were not like in some kind of bureaucratic structure. But once we start to frame art and research uh, as a whole, a bunch of different questions arise, as James Elkins put forward last night. How does art making produce knowledge? And if it doesn't produce knowledge, then what does it actually produce? The second is how is it to be evaluated and compared to other knowledge making disciplines that use text and language, right? So this is the distinction between the knowledge being the work itself versus knowledge being a kind of discursive formation around the work. What is unique and different of the kind of knowledge produced in the humanities and social sciences versus the knowledge if art produces knowledge produced in the making of an art object or an art experience? How are students to be mentored? That's a huge question in Canada. The notion of research creation is also about training, how to train the next generation in this kind of thinking. And then perhaps most important, how does one maintain artistic autonomy within systems of constraint constructed by research prerogatives and structures? Now, in fact, some of you as artists in the room know that all these kinds of bureaucratic modes and of governmentality, talking about research, and of course we saw some of the, the worst examples of it last night from, from James Elkins, particularly in the UK, um, is that in fact most artists don't position their work as making knowledge at all. That's a core principle of research, but they really don't. I don't know any artist who says, I make knowledge. Um, they talk, of course, artists talk of experiences and experiments and events, and if they're in the line of people like Brian Masumi, intent, intensities or affects, 
Artists don't actually start with a well-defined research question or a set of theoretical, methodological, and historical frameworks and objectives to actually even do their work. And as we've heard now in the Black Mountain College uh, description about experiment from, from Ava, um, these kind of epistemological frames of knowing seem to ignore something fundamental that is self-evident in practice, but rarely late in theory late in accounts, which is that art making is not a rational and certainly is an unpredictable activity that's not bound to systematic models or logical chains of decision making. Saying, quote, it works is to admit that accident, failure, misunderstood situations, resource limitations, and misused techniques are all essential elements of making something. This is also not a new concept. Actually, Fire Oven, almost 35 years ago, and against method, basically also said that science has no method. It's a form of epistemological anarchy, which is very interesting from a historian of scientists who actually was then a physicist before that. But the question of unpredictability, and this is a very important thing, this idea of the uncertain that art produces the future, it's important because it brings up a particular reason why we might engage in understanding the relationship between new forms of knowing and experience that happen through material action. This concatenation of research, creation, art, and design appears to be a recent phenomenon. As Georgina Bourne and Andrew Berry write, Research, quote, has taken on a new weight as it increasingly becomes integrated more than ever into broader society and political economy. Um, now, Bourne is a cultural anthropologist who's known for her ethnographic work in large-scale cultural institutions, and Barry is a science studies scholar. They identify this kind of moment right now as part of a generalized shift in the formation of new forms of knowledge societies that are actually also overtaking the humanities and the social sciences within institutional frameworks. So Helga Nawatny, who we heard a little bit last night, who's the head of the ERC, said um, a while back that uh, this is a kind of new mode of knowledge. It's called mode to knowledge production. It's transdisciplinary. It's focused on, quote, the context of an application and the diversity of sites in which this knowledge is formulated and produced. So one of the things Nawatny and Michael Gibbons argue in their work on new knowledge societies is that, in fact, no mode to knowledge is replacing these old forms of knowledge production. Um, the, the concept of art and design practice producing the future is very interesting, though, and it has a not uncontroversial equivalent in Hans-Jörg Reinberger's argument that, quote, research systems are tinkered arrangements that are not set up for the purpose of repetitive operation, but for the continuous reemergence of unexpected events. Now, of course, Reinberger is a science historian and a bi molecular biologist. Experimentation as a machine for making the future has to engender unexpected events. Unquote. If research then exists on the border of the known and the unknown, entirely depending on the way its experimental apparatus is set up, we can also say that art making, like scientific research, constructs futures that cannot be completely predictable. So one thing I'm going to argue is that research creation, this term again that we use in Canada, and its resulting outcomes are similar to scientific experimentation, but not in the manner of copying or representing science or even using its so-called methods. Experimentation takes its materials or enti ent 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 entities as active, dynamic, and changeable, rather than passive, inert, and immutable. Moreover, experimental life transforms these materials into agents or actants that actually have effects in the world. So this is the interesting thing, is the question of effect and how the material, what it, what it does, what it materializes. Experimentation is two things. It's description, but it's also invention. It's truths, and I put this in quotes, and claims on the world are judged by its effects. What it makes with and through its material agencies. Okay, now let's go to the laboratory. And I shift tone completely. I'm gonna focus on this very weird project that I've been doing with Symbiotica for the last three years called Tissue Engineered Muscle Actuators, but its artistic name is a very appropriate one. It's called Futile Labor. Um, and it's, as I said, opening next week in Perth, um, and Paula Antonelli from the MoMA is opening it, so it better be working. Um, to, to give you a context, the, the project involves, so now I have to switch into your scientific minds, and I hope there's a biologist in the room involves the creation of a hybrid semi-living machine in order to conceptually and aesthetically explore the fragile border between life and non-life, machine and organism. 
This machine that we're building consists of a bundle of tissue cultured skeletal mouse muscle cells, C2C12s, this is a cell line that you can buy online, that are grown and organized within a custom designed technological environment called the bioreactor. Sensors that are outfitted into the bioreactor measure the force and displacement of the tiny contractions of these muscles, so we basically give them elect electrical stimuli and they produce contractions. And then we take that and amplify that into the environment onto the bodies of the, of the spectators. So in terms of infrasonic sound, which you, can't, you can only feel but you can't hear, and light, which you can barely see. So in fact, these cells are absolutely beyond, there's no microscope in the room. You encounter them in a, in a vessel in this bioreactor, but you can't see them, so you can only feel their presence in some unheimlich way. Um, and so we try to bring this time scale of this material perception um, of this organic but constructed entity into the time scale of human perception. So I'm going to kind of go now in a Latourian follow the actants text and give you a sense of what it means to research and make within a collective of the human and non-human. So here's the lab. So quote, this is from the book, so I'm quoting now for a long time. Facilities and equipment are spread between the PC2 lab and an adjoining non-containment, non-hazardous materials lab. We first go back and forth as Yunat, this is my collaborator, inventories the materials and instruments necessary for tissue culture work, laminar flow or sterile hood, incubator, water bath, centrifuge, freezers and refrigerators, hemicytometer, inverted microscopes, cryogenetic storage containers, sterilization facilities, culturing flasks and containers, pipettes and pipette dispensers, syringes and needles, media and serum, the bio-waste container, and not last but not least, the cells themselves. Quote, the first thing we are gonna do, Chris, is very simple. We want to get some cells and thaw them and put them into nutrient media to give them all the things they need and hope for the best, unquote. As we exit the lab and move down the hall into a room of minus 80 degree centigrade freezers, I have a palpable sense of excitement at finally getting to meet these cantankerous cells, those bits of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus that have caused our engineering collaborators so much grief in the last three months trying to in designing their magic tools. Naturally, the magic tools of these engineers are basically stretchers that would basically stretch these cells mechanically so then we, they would produce contractions that we then would capture electronically. Naturally, what we retrieve from the frozen depths will be microscopic and most certainly far from the visceral shock of a final biologically fantasized artwork, but this anticipation builds nonetheless. We open one of the large 80 degree freezers, minus 80 degree freezers, where we extract a blue circular container affectionately dubbed by scientists as Mr. Frosty from the ice coated bottom shelf. There you go. In fact, we couldn't find the container because the freezer had been moved. Standing in for Mr. Frosty's professional but far less glamorous name is cryogenetic freezing container a plastic apparatus holding the tiny vials that will make the long trip between the freezer and the lab more than once during their adventure of being woken to life. As Yunat takes the tiny plastic vials and begins warming them in her hands, like conducting a seance for the dead, I naively ask what is in these vials, thinking it is some kind of solution we will use in the defrosting process. Surprised, she turns to me with a smile, quote, life in my hands, unquote. For all of my anticipation, I admit somewhat facetiously that I had expected something grander than minute plastic tubes filled with partially crystallized matter. This certainly seems a far cry from what biologist Robert Hooke described in 1650 when, staring at a slice of cork under a microscope, he named the cell. Hooke's inspiration came not from the intricate membrane-enclosed entities he glimpsed through crude microscopy, but from the Latin word cellula, denoting the isolated chambers that monks inhabited. After Hooke's original naming and almost simultaneously the Dutch inventor of the microscope, Leeuwenhoek's observations of protozoan bacteria, dubbed affectionately in his arguments to the Royal Society as animalcules, the theorization of the cell was essentially to remain dormant until the mid-19th century. In 1838, German botanist Matthias Schlieden and his zoologist friend Theodor Schwann invented the discipline we now call cell theory with their singular and powerful argument that the cell was the basic unit of living matter. 
If Schwann extended Schlieden's theory that all plants were constructed of cells to animals, another scientist, the polymath Rudolf Virchow, added the essential final step to the doctrine of cell theory, that cells can only be derived from other cells, omnis cellula a cellula. That cell theory was at first entangled in instruments of observation rather than the sciences of physical chemical matter fits squarely into Kangium's argument in his essay on the topic that cell theory should, quote, be considered a collection of protocols of observation, unquote. The, uh, quote, the arm, uh, the eye armed with the microscope sees microscopic life as composed of cells, just as the naked eye sees macroscopic life as making up the biosphere, unquote. Kangiyam, of course, wrote this way before Rotson and Crick's discovery of the double, double helical stands of DNA in the 1950s that not only extended the role of the cell, but finally explained Virchow's statement, how living cells produce other living cells. Yet we're using cell lines, immortal, cancerous cells purchased from industrial scale tissue banks that unlike cells derived from primary tissue can endlessly divide. Although the most famous of cell lines, the fable Gila, was extracted from a human, the African-American woman, Henrietta Lacks, who died of cervical cancer in the 1950s, the particular one we will intimately come to know is derived from non-humans, the skeletal muscle tissue of mice whose thigh muscles were crushed in order to simulate the effects of dystrophy. So in fact, we are using the cells of a mouse that died 35 years ago. Returning to the lab, so this is the process basically of how muscle cells uh, differentiate. They start with satellite cells, they then form myoblasts, which are individual cells, then they fuse together to form tubes called myotubes, and then those eventually fuse to form fiber. And if you grow these cells in culture medium and you change the medium after the differentiation process, they spontaneously start to move, to twitch, to expand. Returning to the lab, as Inot carefully pla places the vials onto the floor of the hood in order to prepare another pipette to extract the cells and move them to a tissue flash for feeding, I get a quick demonstration of how fragile life literally is, watching how the powerful recirculating air in the hood almost blows over the vials. The feeding ritual that follows is as abstracted as the rest of the procedure. You know, it sucks the cells, perhaps millions, from the vial with the pipette, this is an image, and dispenses them in a not quite nonchalant fashion, in nonchalant fashion into the tissue flask. Once again, the material consistency of life takes me aback. This time, in the, tish, in the, in the flask, a smectic blob that appears more like dishwashing detergent than actually the complex molecular organization of membrane organelles and protoplasm that makes up the standard macroscopic image of the cell found in biology textbooks. The foamy substance that makes its way up the pipette reminds us, as Sloterdijk, Peter Sloterdijk articulates in the Mammoth Sphere Trilogy, that foam consists of the prima materia, the generative substance that is both fragile and life-giving. Dispensing the foamy cells into the tissue flask, Yunot changes the pipette again. This is an incredible waste, I think. 15 pipettes in 10 minutes. She proceeds to add 15 milliliters of previously mixed medium. In the upright flask, the reddish color of the medium blends with the foamy but now complete invisible cells that are barely quarter full. Picking up the flask, she moves to the incubator behind and places the container on the gleaming stainless steel shelf, all the while explaining that the cells are unhappy because they are moved back and forth between freezer and bath, frozen between different states of context, half awake, half suspended in a nebulous underworld of continuously changing thresholds. Quote, we have to make them warm, unquote. For the moment, I'm taken aback by this anthropocentric use of language, an anthropomorphic use of language. From what appears before us, for all we know, we're looking at red dishwater and not life itself. I make a quick note of this statement as Yanat cleans the surface of the hood with ethanol, turns off the light and ventilator and shuts the hood. That's it for today. Okay, one other story. Later in the week, Yanat arranges we meet Gavin, a young physiology professor with expertise in skeletal muscles whose lab specializes in different kinds of measurement, forces, and visualization of how those forces affect the length and structure of muscle tissue. In contrast to the clinically sterile tissue culture molecular biology labs, Gavin's cluttered space, these are the labs, this is the cluttered research lab, uh, Gavin's cluttered space in the decaying physiology building immediately feels different, more chaotic, chock-a-block with scientific instruments and a bewildering variety of shapes, sizes, and functions. 
looking more like an analog electronic music studio than a life science lab, with cables and wires strewn about and emerging out of various nondescript but expensive looking black and white boxes, Gavin takes us through a show and tell of the apparatuses lurking in his space. With their amalgamation of material, organic, so these are the devices. This is a $50,000 device that pulls cells with a force transducer and measures uh, tendon uh, tissue and measures um, its uh, uh, force displacement. Some also interesting devices. This amalgamation of material, organic, and recording-based components Gavin's measuring devices parallel historian of science Hedwig Schmidgen's argument that machines utilized in the life sciences are not simple instruments, but indeed, quote, a transversal coupling of bodies and technology of human beings, technological objects, and recording surfaces. Schmidgen's work in the experimentation of life reminds us that the history of experimentation in biology cannot be separated from its machinic frame. As Gavin explains the way in which his instruments actuate and measure muscle actions, I return to the question that I continually am obsessed by in this project. What kind of temporal behavior in these muscles will result from actuating them, either by chemical, electrical, mechanical simulation? What kind of time is produced when we artificially chalk these muscles and they produce contractions? What can be demonstrable, felt to a spectator, we're not satisfied with Gavin's responses. We prod him for further information. Why, when starved, do cultured muscle cells start twitching uncontrollably in a backwards and forwards motion that appears, at least in time lags video, to barely resemble periodic or even one-shot movement? Pathology, Gavin answers. Tissue culture cells are damaged and thus may store up excess calcium that is somehow then released due to chemical imbalances in the signaling between the myoblasts as they differentiate as the composition of the nutrient media is changed. So you can see that as an artist, dealing with this battery of terms, of language, of instruments is perhaps interesting because in fact you might see very similar relationships to the studio. And in fact, by focusing on instruments that actually produce phenomena, because these don't just measure, but they actually also bring these phenomena in a certain way into being, because we can't see them, we can't touch them, we can't understand them without the instruments, basically it aligns very much with the work that Andrew Pickering has done, a very well-known sociologist of science, who talks about science being performative. It's one that departs from the idea of science producing representational forms of knowledge, as correspondences or mirrors to reality, and instead grapples with the material agency of science. Matter, quote, writes Pickering, has agency because its actions make a difference in respect of human scientists, for example, or in all of our daily lives. Here I refer to actions that make a difference as performances. Performances are what agents do, whether they're human or non-human. My conviction is we need to move to a performative rather than representational idiom for studying and reflecting on science and being in general." Unquote. If there is a great ontological divide between nature and culture, nature and society, between legitimate knowing and episteme versus practical knowledge, techne, then there's maybe another divide in the current debates about research, creation, art, and research. A methodological one between practice, our practice, what is artists, and what do they do, artists, creators do, versus what they think from afar. So this is the invitation for all the scholars in the room to get their hands dirty, wet, scraped, burned by solder, with spills from cells, to go into the studios and labs with artists and researchers to get a sense of the messiness and at the same time the unpredictability of making things. So I'm going to finish with the last page of the book just to give you a bit of a sense of the frame of this. What is the alien? The alien is the assemblage of contingent conditions, interactions, and effects that change us but at the same time escape us. It exemplifies our inability to, in fact, control the results of the experiment, and more importantly, to account for the effects and effects, affects that the experiment generates. The model doesn't work, usually. The experience that opens up goes beyond what has been imagined. The hope for results metamorphose into something else that cracks our expectations, defies our hand, and our expertise. The alien lands us at the precipice, and I like the notion of precarity very much, not just neoliberal precarity, but also precarity of knowing. Knowing actually fails. This is why the French term experience, with its dual meaning, is so useful. That of experiment or speculation, 
and that of experience, something happening to us. Alien agency is thus another in a series of entanglements. We cannot know the results of the experience without doing it, living in it. Histories of scientific practice tell us this as well, but science seeks to stabilize its agencies, make them predictable, reproducible, durable, repeatable. Somewhere, someone else can do the experiment with the same conditions to hopefully achieve the same results. That's why science is, needs to be repeatable, so the experiment can slowly percolate. The experiment is done enough times. A fact finally emerges. It's indisputable, and it forms a new reality. Artistic experience, or experience, the effective and improvisatory assemblage of conditions that operate on and transform us does actually something else. It destabilizes both the phenomena and its perception and affection, keeping things moving and unsettled. What better way to achieve this than to work with stuff that has a life and operability of its own, unwieldy and still productive? The alien doesn't rid us of the human and imagine a world of objects without us. That's very much the argument of OOP or speculative realism. But quite the contrary, it actually makes us realize that be, to be human today is to be mutable, transforming, alive with the possibilities of techno-scientific delineation and determination. And it warns us that we will always be thwarted in our attempts to harness and control that beyond us. Finally, there is a another alien, that of the method for depicting these things. What the alienness of the struggle to make something with and in a more than human world does is act, actually ask us to rethink the process and the practice of records, of recording, of ethnography, of reporting. The usual ethnographic accounts of such practices document situations that cannot actually give us the total picture. Alienness provokes us to theorize culture anew, to recognize its temporal emergent dynamic being, not contained, elusive to capture, and even to success. Agency, acts, behaviors cannot be described in words only, but also in their temporal unfolding, in their performance. The artistic act makes the conditions possible to destabilize the known and reinvent it anew. In other words, in what I've tried to tell you in the last 45 minutes, alienness may also help us rethink what it means to create an account of unruly experience, not only with human culture, but that which is on the verge beyond us. I return to the lab. It seems to be there within my grasp. Just some more tuning. A little bit of solder in the joints, adjust the code, shift the volume, tweak the parameters, change the light, and then suddenly the work materializes. I observe it and I feel its sensations. Standing at a distance, I finally know it. Success. The sweat drips from my chin. This will be next week with me. <laughs> Heart races. I feel its presence assured. It works. But then, breakdown. It starts to slip from my grasp. I try and hold on to it, but it defies me, fading till I no longer sense its presence. And then in an instant, it's gone. A dim memory, nothing left but the tingling on my skin, and then even that dissolves. Exhausted, no success this time. Turn out the lights close the door, experiment is over. Thank you. <laughs>